All right, well, as the children are being dismissed, let's uh, take our Bibles this morning and open them to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 39 and verse 19. I'm going to try to finish the chapter this morning. Of course, as was alluded to by um, Bill in the announcements, the outbreak that happened yesterday concerning uh, Iran and Israel, I gave a five-minute <laughs> sort of commentary on that in the first hour, and I, when I finished my five minutes, an hour had passed. So um, if you want that commentary, just listen to what we said in the first hour. So I will not go through this again, lest I commit the same sin. But all of that to say that we believe that what is happening is fitting into a prophetic blueprint. And the great thing about it is God is in control. Amen. What we're looking at this morning here in this session is the book of Genesis. And the title of our message this morning is God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness. God is 100% faithful 100% of the time. That's his character. That's his nature. Paul, writing to Timothy, said, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. For God to not be faithful to what God himself has said would be for God to deny an attribute of his. So everything God does in our lives, everything he says to us, you can take it to the bank. In fact, it's the only word that you can really trust in this world of conflicting opinions is God's word. And we clearly see this faithfulness here in the life of Joseph. A man that God has raised up not to birth the nation of Israel. That has already been accomplished through his work through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But a man God has raised up to preserve the nation of Israel. And that's what the rest of the book of Genesis chapters 37 through 50 are all about. The story or the historical account of Joseph really begins in Genesis 37, which documents his visions that would be fulfilled within his own lifetime, two visions that invoke the jealousy of his brothers. I mean, who are you to have these visions of self-grandeur, they thought. You're the 11th born, after all. And they betrayed Joseph, they left him for dead, and as the story unfolded, they sold him into Egypt. There's the trajectory of Joseph from the land of Israel down southwest into Egypt. Joseph now is in a different country around a different group of people outside of his homeland, and yet God's faithfulness is with him wherever he goes. Chapter 38, you'll recall, is a description of why God is using Joseph. Had God left the nation of Israel in Canaan, they would have morally disintegrated. They would have intermarried with the Canaanites. And God has too big a purpose for the nation of Israel to let that happen. Might I just say that he has too big a purpose for the nation of Israel today than to let Iran blot her out. 
that cannot happen because Israel is the gift that keeps on giving. God has purpose to bless the world through the nation of Israel. He's done that. He gave us the scriptures through the Jewish people, the Savior through the Jewish people. There's one more blessing on the horizon for the human race, and that's the kingdom through the nation of Israel. This is why there's always a satanic plot to eradicate Israel, and yet God seems to come through always for Israel. You're watching that same conflict on your own news feeds and television screens. Last night, beginning with Iran launching missiles into Israel proper and the city of Jerusalem. So Genesis 38 is why God is using Joseph. The story of Joseph resumes in Genesis 39, most of which we've covered. We see Joseph's blessing in Potiphar's house. The blessings keep following him. And when things are going well, that's when to look out for an enemy attack from the adversary. And that's where he falls into temptation. He stands up under temptation, but false accusation from Potiphar's wife. And as that accusation now is being fomented by her, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. It now leads to his imprisonment in Egypt. And that's what verses 19 through 23 are speaking of that we're going to look at today. We can divide verses 19 through 23 as follows. Potiphar's actions, verses 19 through 20, and yet the blessings of God continue to follow Joseph even into prison. Verses 21 through 23. You see, you can change the circumstances in a person's life. You can change the country. You can change the people that he's around. You can take away his freedom. But the truth of the matter is, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change. The world changes. The scenery changes. Your job may change. Your location may change. But the character of God never does change. And Joseph, as a 17-year-old, is experiencing these things. Notice Potiphar's action when his wife falsely, Potiphar doesn't know it's false, of course, accused Joseph, this Hebrew, of sexually violating her. Notice, first of all, his anger, verse 19. It says, now when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him, all defamatory, by the way, all lies, none of what she said happened, spoke to him saying, this is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. You know, the interesting thing about committing adultery, Joseph did not become involved in sexual sin, but Potiphar's, Potiphar himself believes that Joseph is involved in sexual sin with his wife. The interesting thing about committing adultery is it damages the adulterer more than anybody else. And I realize that no actual sexual sin took place here, but you do have warnings about sexual immorality in the book of Proverbs about this issue. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 32 through 35 says, the one who commits adultery with a woman is lacking sense. He who would destroy himself does it. Wounds and disgrace he will find, and his reproach will not be blotted out. For jealousy enrages a man, and he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not accept any ransom, nor will he be satisfied, though you give him many gifts. The adulterer involves himself in a sin that's actually self-destructive, not the least of which the spouse, the husband, when he finds out what has happened, um, will be in a state of rage. He'll be in a state of anger that cannot be 
satiated. It can't be pacified. You can explain yourself. You can give gifts to the offended party and that rage will not cease. The, the foolishness of sexual immorality, the, the foolishness of, a, of an adulterous relationship, the, the world makes it sound like it's so easy. In fact, they don't even call it adultery anymore. They call it having an affair. I mean, that sounds so much more innocuous, doesn't it, than adultery. And yet, as you read the book of Proverbs, it's filled with exhortations to stay away from such a sin. Not only does it violate the will and the character of God, but it actually destroys the person committing the adultery, not the least of which is the enraged husband. This is what Joseph now is experiencing, although he has been slandered here and has done nothing wrong. Notice now the actions of Pharaoh when he learns this, uh, verse 20. It says, so Joseph's master, I said Pharaoh, I think I meant Potiphar. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in jail. Probably very easy for Joseph to become embittered at God at this point. Lord, I haven't done anything but right. You gave me some visions. I shared them with my brothers and I was sold as a slave into Egypt. And then I found myself in Potiphar's house. I was a good steward. He promoted me. And now this false accusation has been raised against me. And now I find myself in a place of incarceration. You know, it's one thing to have bad things happen to you when you're doing evil. It's another thing to have bad things happen to you when you're not doing anything other than trying to please the Lord. And yet that's exactly where God wanted Joseph in prison. Because as you're going to see, moving into chapter 40 and 41, without this incarceration, Joseph would have never been elevated to second in command in Egypt. Keep that in mind when you're going through a lot of unfair treatment from people and you really don't deserve it. Typically what's happening is God has something in mind that he's not ready to tell you yet. There is a, a purpose in it. Just like there was a purpose in all of Joseph's struggles. So he is put into a prison. He goes from Potiphar's household to now a place of incarceration. Arnold Fruchtenbaum says this about the prison. It says in verse 20 came the imprisonment. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison. This prison was where the king's prisoners were bound. This was a different kind of prison. It was the royal prison. There is more than one Hebrew word for prison, and the term used here is a word that is found only in Genesis chapters 39 and 40. It is actually an Egyptian loan word, and it has the meaning of a royal prison. Potiphar was an officer of Pharaoh's, and so was actually under his authority. Everything we know about Potiphar, he was an officer of Pharaoh, he was the captain of the executioners, and he probably could have executed Joseph. But he didn't. Because God had a purpose for Joseph. It was too early for his life to be terminated. So he is put into sort of this royal prison, which Potiphar had the ability to do since he, his wife has accused him of sexually violating her. But notice how the blessings continue to follow Joseph, verses 21 through 23. We have, uh, for example, the relation to the prison keeper, verse 21. Joseph's relationship with the prison keeper. Joseph's elevation, verse 22. And then the chapter is going to end much like it started, with Joseph elevated to a position of authority where he actually has control of everything under the prison keeper's watch. 
The prison keeper didn't even have to check on Joseph. His character was so trustworthy. The similar thing happened to him in verses 1 through 6 when he was elevated, you'll recall, in Potiphar's house. But notice where these blessings come. Isn't that one of our song titles? Don't worry, I won't sing it to you. Um, Praise to God from whom all blessings flow. Blessings come from the hand of God. God is the source of blessings. Spiritually, physically, materially, anything that's happening in your life that you consider a blessing, you know, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. That's a great thing to do, by the way, when we get to a place where we start to feel sorry for ourselves because of some, something that's gone wrong. It's just a matter of stopping, taking mental discipline of your thoughts, and actually articulating the blessings that you do have. You start to do that, and it changes us away from being you know, negative nillies, so to speak, to the type of people that God has called us to be, people that walk in joy. So blessings are coming to Joseph, and we see here the source of those blessings, verse 21. They're God himself. It says there, but the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. It's interesting that as we've traveled through this chapter, that seems to be a dominant theme. For example, if you go back to verse 2, the beginning of the verse, it says the Lord was with Joseph. Verse 3, the Lord was with him. Verse uh, 21, which we just read, the Lord was with Joseph. Verse 23, which we will read, the Lord was with him. What an important thing to know as your whole life is being uprooted and you're sold as a slave into Egypt. How, how important it is to know that God is with you every step of the way. You know, when, you're, when your job or your school transfers you from one place of the country to another, one part of the world to another, it's important to understand that no matter where you go, you're never outside the reach of God. God is always with us. Jesus, by the way, promised this in Matthew 28, verse 20, as he was giving the disciples the great commission, teaching them to preach the gospel to every nation. And he makes the statement that as you travel, as you go transnational, remember that I am with you. Matthew 28, verse 20, Jesus told the disciples, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am always with you even until the end of the age. What an important thing it was for those men to know, most of whom would die martyrs' deaths in the process of fulfilling the Great Commission. What what a great thing to know for missionaries, that are seeking to serve the Lord overseas. No matter, where the, no matter where you go, God is always with you. Hebrews 13 and verse five, it says of God, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. Jesus told us in John 14 verses 16 and 17, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, but it does not see him or know him, but you know him. Because he abides with you and and will be in you. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, the disciples in a state of panic that Jesus was leaving And he says to them, it's actually to your advantage that I'm leaving. Because when I leave, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete in Greek, the one who comes alongside to assist, will be with you and inside of you forever. Financial prosperity, financial adversity, the Holy Spirit is within you forever. 
in sickness and in health, the Holy Spirit is with you and in you forever. How important that is as we walk through life's difficulties and valleys. In, in success and failure, in, in triumph and tragedy, the Holy Spirit is in you and the Holy Spirit is with you forever. This is what Joseph here is experiencing. No matter where he went, the Lord was with him. And this promise of the Lord being with you over and over again is actually spoken many times in the book of Genesis thus far to the patriarchs. Long before we got to the story of Joseph. Genesis 26 verse 3, I will be with you. Genesis 26 24, I am with you. Genesis 26, 28, the Lord has been with you. Genesis 28, verse 15, I will not leave you. Genesis 31, verse 3, I will be with you. It's almost as if God is trying to get a point across here. Yeah, I've asked you to walk through some, some difficult waters. I know some of you, just by reading the prayer requests that we receive at this church, are walking through some difficult waters. Some of you are facing health issues you've never faced before. Others are under a financial pressure that they've never known before. And yet, it's so significant to understand that God is with us in those circumstances, just as he was with Joseph. And you'll notice here the reference to the kindness of God. Verse 21, the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. I'm reminded of the book of Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, which says it's the kindness of the Lord that leads you to repentance. You know, sometimes we think repentance comes through a good hellfire and damnation sermon. And there's a place for that. We can have a fireside chat anytime you want. I'll try to supply the fire. But the bottom line is many of the things that lead us under repentance is not a hellfire and damnation type of presentation. It's a presentation on the goodness of God. The kindness of God, the, the faithfulness of God. I mean, I mean, as we see the kindness of God exhibit in our lives, we say to ourselves, well, how can I do anything other than try to walk the way that he wants me to walk? Live the way he wants me to live. Think the way he wants me to think. And it, at the end of the day, it really wasn't some sort of threat that led me unto repentance. It's an understanding of his kindness. This, I believe, is one of the reasons why the concept of grace, unmerited favor, is so minimized in so many places and so many churches. The, the leadership feels like they have to you know, threaten people over and over again with some sort of divine retaliation to get them to live right. I've discovered that the opposite is true. The more a person really understands the height, the width, the depth of the love of God for the saints. By the way, that's what Paul prays for, the Ephesians and Ephesians 3. I just, I just want you to understand how much God loves you. I want you to understand the full dimensions of his love, its height, its width, its depth. I mean... That's in the section of the book before he gives any exhortations related to how to live at all. He doesn't start teaching people how to live for God until you get to chapters 4 through 6. What I'm speaking of here in the book of Ephesians is in chapter 3. And he's just explaining how much God loves you. And he prays that their eyes of your understanding would be opened, that you could see the love of God for the saints. It's height that has dimensions, it's width, it's depth. And then Paul says, now that we've covered that, let's talk about how to live as a Christian. God, at the end of the day, is kind 
and good. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 says of God, God is love. Love is his core attribute. It doesn't just say he's loving, it says he is love. He's the definition of love. He epitomizes love. And Paul says in Romans 2 verse 4, that really is what leads us into repentance. Understanding the kindness of God. People weren't kind to Joseph, but God was kind to Joseph. And the Lord was with him wherever he went. And look at the result uh, of these things. Second part of verse 21. It says, And gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The favor of God. The favor of God being so strong on a human being that it's recognizable by the outside world. That's what Joseph had. And by the way, that's what you have. Because the Bible says, Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. He says here, you are a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. See, the light is for the benefit of somebody else. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. He also calls us here, Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16, the salt of the earth. What does the salt produce? It produces thirst. The favor of God on a human being so strongly that the unsaved world becomes thirsty for their own relationship with God because they see the favor of God on a person. That's what our lives are to produce in God. This is what Joseph's life was producing. His life was coming across people that were pagan, godless, corrupted, knew nothing about the things of God, and yet when they encounter Joseph, they say, you know, there's something different about you. And it's so different that I actually want to take you and elevate you to a position of authority over those things that I have custody over. You might find yourself in a strange job, a strange location, a strange city, but God puts you there as a light to the people around you. He wants to use you in a significant and substantial way to reach a lost and dying world? That's a great question for us to ask. Lord, are our lives lived in such a way that we are actually a source of illumination for other people? Are our lives lived in such a way that people can see what you're doing in my life and they can become thirsty for their own relationship with the Lord? If that's not happening in your life, you just get before the Lord and you ask him why. And you ask him to rearrange your life in such a way that you would become that vessel of salt and light to the world around us. There is a saying that you may be, we may be the only Bible somebody ever reads. You might be around people that will never read the Bible, mock the Bible, in fact, never darken the door of a church. But through you, they encounter God because they see something different in your life. That's what the Lord wants to produce in us. That's what he is producing here with this man, Joseph. And this leads to his elevation within the prison. Verse 20, it says, the chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all, notice that word all, the prisoners who were in the jail, so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. Now, you might say, to quote that great uh, theologian, Yogi Berra, this is deja vu all over again, because it is, if you go back to verse 2, this is exactly what happened in Potiphar's house. 
excuse me, verse 4. So Joseph found favor in his sight, Potiphar's sight, and became his personal servant and made him overseer over his house and all that he owned and put in his charge. Potiphar, whose very name itself exhibited Egyptian polytheism, a man that did not know God at all, actually encountered God by observing Joseph. He saw something so special, so different, so unique that he promoted Joseph. And when Joseph is falsely accused and thrown into prison, the same process recycles. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So just as Joseph is promoted in Potiphar's household, now he is promoted in prison. And everything the prison keeper has is put under Joseph's charge, just like everything Potiphar had was put under Joseph's charge. You see that happening there in verse 23. It says, the chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. Boy, that's deja vu all over again, isn't it? Look back at verse six. So he, that's Potiphar, left everything he owned in Joseph's charge with him there. He did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. The scenery changes, but God's faithfulness never changes. Just as Potiphar didn't even need to check anymore on what Joseph was doing, neither did the keeper of the prison. And then you look at the second part of verse 23, and it says, whatever he did, the Lord made it to prosper. We have, and I know that I'm partially guilty of this, reacted so aggressively against the prosperity gospel that we've almost made it sound as if prosperity in God is some kind of sin. There is a prosperity gospel out there that's very unbiblical. They come at it from a little God's perspective. The very first full-length book I ever read on this heresy was by Michael Horton. The title of the book, written in the late 1980s, was called The Agony of Deceit. And it was sort of an expose of various television ministries promising people prosperity. If, by the way, you sent their do your donation in to their ministry. They never said, send it to the orphanage, send it somewhere else, send it into us, and God is obligated to bless you. And it comes from this idea that we as Christians are little gods. And as a little god, and the moment you start to see yourself as a god in any sense is the moment you're on thin ice theologically because that's the lie that got Adam and Eve into trouble all the way back in Genesis 3. Ye shall be like God, the serpent told them. But according to this doctrine, because you are a little God, you are entitled, there's, there's the issue, to a life of health and wealth and prosperity. And if you are not experiencing these things, then you are not walking in faith and you are not accessing verbal laws where you can actually command these things into existence. So if your body is suffering in any sense, you can command the disease out of you. So the whole concept of suffering for the things of God is lost. Paul himself suffered from frequent illnesses and ailments, he tells us in Galatians chapter four and verse 13. Paul suffered from a thorn in the flesh, which was agonizing asking the Lord to remove it three times. The Lord said, no, my 
grace is sufficient for you. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10. You can read about that. But the prosperity movement overlooks all of these things. You can command diseases out of your body. What's interesting is all of the people that used to teach the prosperity gospel, they're all dead. I mean, I made a list once of all of the leaders that were teaching this in the 80s and just put a check next to the ones that had passed away. I mean, what do they die of? They must have died of some sort of disease. Something's going to get us, right? And it's not just your physical body, it's your bank account and your wealth. You can literally command wealth into existence. And you don't have to ask God for these things. They're yours by divine right because you are a little God. You are a kid of the king. And that is a blatantly false doctrine. We are not little gods. I have no right this side of eternity to prosperity and health. I can pray for those things. But I can't command them into existence through more faith and accessing verbal laws. It's, it's heretical. And yet they teach this around the clock on so-called Christian television, and the reason they teach it is this is what people want to hear. And so people send in their money because they feel that their lives are gonna be blessed. And it's very tempting to be so aggressive at denouncing that to kind of move to the opposite extreme that somehow God doesn't want prosperity in anyone's life at all. I'm here to tell you that God can give you health. He can give you prosperity. I don't think it's a guarantee, but when he does it, he does it out of his grace and his goodness towards us. This is the kind of thing that Joseph is experiencing here. He, he's prospering, not because he deserves it, not because he's commanding it into existence, not because he is a little God walking in faith, accessing verbal laws, but it's just the good hand of the Lord on him. And if that's happening in your life, praise the Lord. That's God's hand towards you as well. Accept that as coming from God. Don't, don't go to an extreme with it. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8 talks about this kind of thing. It says, this, is the book, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have success. Psalm chapter 1 and verse 3 talks about that righteous man distinguished from the wicked man. And it says, He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and in whatever he does he prospers. That's the same language here. That's being used of Joseph. How about to Uzziah, the king? It says of him in 2 Chronicles 26, verse 5, it says, He continued to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who had an understanding through the visions of God. Now, this is what it says of Uzziah. As long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him. The problem with Uzziah, as you get to the second part of the chapter, is he stopped seeking the Lord things started to kind of fall apart in his life. He spent his waning days as a leper when you study that chapter. But as, as he was seeking the Lord early in his life, th things were happening, things were materializing, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's no, there's no sin in that. Is it biblically guaranteed? No. Can you command it into existence? No. Do you get that because you're a little God? No. Do you get that because you've gone to the right seminars and memorized the right verbal laws? No. But this kind of thing can and does happen to people. And it was happening to Joseph. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
and do not lean on your own understanding and in your all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. That's called a conditional promise. God promises to make your path straight. You say, well, Lord, I don't really feel like my paths are straight. Well, are you keeping your end of the bargain? Are you trusting in the Lord with all your heart? Are you not leaning on your own understanding? Are you acknowledging him in everything? Not some things, everything. Then God makes you a reciprocal promise that if you do those three things, he will make your path straight. He wants your life to work. He wants your life to count. He wants your life to to be used in such a way that other people would look at your life and see the salt in your life and develop a natural thirst for the things of God simply by watching you. There is a biblical prosperity. And so let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater here. Let's not be so aggressive at denouncing an obvious false doctrine that we move into this sort of poverty complex that God wants us all sick and poor. Um, well, maybe God does want us, maybe he wants you sick and poor for a season because he can teach you things when you're sick and poor <laughs> that you're not willing to listen to when you're healthy and prosperous. You know, my, my cancer scare, I have to be honest with you, Since we discovered that, that diagnosis was given in February, I probably learned more about the things of God in the past few months in an accelerated way than any other time in my life. This is how God can use adversity and difficulty because he can get you in a position where you're forced to listen. When things are going great, you really don't have to listen. Lord, I'll, I'll check in with you when I need you. But don't think that if you're in that position of adversity, it's some kind of permanent thing. God can change, God can reverse circumstances in your life very, very quickly. You're gonna see this with Joseph. I mean, he's gonna go from a prison to a pinnacle. He's gonna go from being betrayed by his brothers to being demoted into a prison to second in command over the whole nation. So yeah, there's a season for adversity. There's a season in his life for prosperity. Both are from the hand of the Lord. That's why Psalm 1, chapter 1 and verse 3 of the righteous man says, he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. There are seasons for fruits and vegetables. I'm an expert on that because I like to eat over at the steakhouse over here and I always want corn. Every time I go in and my wife says he's ordering corn again, aw shucks or something like that. I can't get corn year round. No, that's out of season this year, sir. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Just like vegetables and food, they go through different seasons. This whole subject of prosperity and adversity, it goes through different seasons. I mean, you might be in a tremendously prosperous season, but it may not be that way tomorrow. The opposite might be true. You might be in a position of tremendous adversity, but that could be reversed in a minute. And this is where Satan, as you walk through a valley, will sadly whisper in your ear, things are never going to change. And if it gets bad enough, he'll say, why don't you just take your own life? Many people do, because they don't understand this, the concepts of seasons. 
Joseph was going through these different seasons in his life, adversity, prosperity, but the prosperity was as much from the hand of God as was the adversity. It's not something to shy away from. The way it's presented on so-called Christian TV, yes, shy away from that. But go back to the word of God and you'll see the proper role of prosperity in its season on page after page after page of scripture. You'll notice that Joseph's circumstances changed, but the character of God in his life never did. Malachi chapter three and verse six of God, it says, for I, the Lord, do not change. Human beings change, locations, jobs, careers, socioeconomic status, health, relationships, constantly in a state of flux. God says, I never change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And this is why we've entitled this message, The Faithfulness of God. Proverbs 18, verse 24 it says, a man of too many friends comes to ruin. So be careful about your friends list there on social media. A man of too many friends comes to ruin. But then it says, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Nobody experienced this more than Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel 3. Nebuchadnezzar threw these young teenagers into the fiery furnace, expecting them to be incinerated because they would not bow down to Nebuchadnezzar's idolatrous image. And it says this in Daniel 3, 24 and 25. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste and he said to the officials, was it not three men that we cast into the fire? And keep in mind that the fire was so hot that when these three youths were cast into the fire, the people that cast them into the fire were immediately killed themselves. All in Daniel 3. Was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, certainly, O king, but then it says in verse 25, Nebuchadnezzar, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. I don't know <laughs> your interpretation of it. I think that was Jesus. The son of God in the presence of that fire protecting Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. A man of too many friends comes to ruin, but there is one who sticks closer than a brother. That, by the way, is what Christ is called over and over again in the Bible. He's called true, but he's also called faithful. Revelation 19 and verse 11, describing Jesus returning to planet Earth in his second advent. John says, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on it is called faithful, faithful and true. And in righteousness, he, he judges and makes war. Think of uh, seeing a vision of Jesus returning in his glorified state. How would you describe that? John says, I saw in it God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is faithful. Earlier today, before Sunday school, we had the opportunity to exercise 1 John 1, verse 9. Why do that? Not to restore one's position, but to restore broken fellowship, which inhibits our ability to receive fully from the Holy Spirit and why should I even do that? Why should I exercise 1 John 1 verse 9? Because he's faithful. That's what 1 John 1 
9 says. If we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Anything God promises to do, he is faithful to do it 100% of the time because that's his core character. And nobody was tested in this like Daniel. Because as you study the book of Daniel, there is a political sea change that happens in Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5 is when the politics that he was under totally changes. And this may be instructive to you because maybe you're in a new position in your job. Maybe you're under a new manager. Maybe you're supervising new employees. And you're wondering to yourself, well, God sure was faithful under the old arrangement. Can I really trust him under the new arrangement? That's what Daniel was facing. And God was so faithful to Daniel when Babylon was in power, but now it's different because the Persians are in power. The Persians, Daniel 5, overthrow the Babylonians. 539 B.C. is when that happened. If you're interested, it's the whole handwriting on the wall chapter. In fact, Daniel, as a youth, saw a vision where he saw this political change coming because he saw a head of gold, that would be the empire of Babylon, replaced by the chest and arms of silver, that would be the empire of Medo-Persia. Daniel and before him, Nebuchadnezzar saw the various kingdoms that would trample down Israel during the times of the Gentiles, something that the nation of Israel, even right now, is still experiencing. And he saw the different empires as different body parts of a statue. Head of gold would be Babylon that trampled the Jewish nation down, took them into the captivity from about 605 to 539, then he saw the chest and arms of silver replacing the head of gold. That would be the empire of Persia, Medo-Persia to be exact, that would trample down Israel from about 539 to 331. And then he saw, after the chest and arms of silver, the belly and thighs of bronze. This is an empire that would come into existence long after Daniel had left the scene about 331 to 63 BC, and then he saw the legs of iron, the empire of Rome, probably two legs representing the eastern and western divisions of Rome that would trample down Israel from 63 BC when General Pompey came into the land of Israel, subjugated the Jewish people, took away their right to capital punishment, to execute their own criminals, which becomes the explanation as to why they had to turn Christ once they found him guilty of blasphemy over to Rome for execution. Rome took that power away, took away their sovereignty from about 63 BC to AD 70. The vision flashes forward to the end of the church age, after the church is gone, where the revived Roman Empire, coming from the base of the cultural inheritance of ancient Rome, a ten-king confederacy headed by the Antichrist in the tribulation period will trample down Israel only to be instantaneously destroyed by the coming kingdom of God that stone cut without human hands that strikes immediately the feet of the statue and then grows till it fills the whole earth. The kingdom of God, when it comes, will not be gradual. It will instantaneously strike the feet of the statue. We are not in the kingdom now. Sorry to be the spoiler today and the Debbie Downer. If we were in the kingdom today, I want to know why I'm living in the ghetto section. Because I don't see kingdom conditions around me anywhere. In fact, when I look at my TV, I see warfare, particularly last night. 
the kingdom is a time period where they'll beat their swords into plowshares. And what is happening to the nation of Israel through that whole transition of leaders, the faithfulness of God? God is being faithful to Israel right now as they're walking through a a portion of the times of the Gentiles. Is God going to be faithful to Daniel as an individual as we move from the head of gold to the chest and arms of silver? That's what the lion's den is about. He's unjustly accused, much like Joseph, thrown into the lion's den. He is sort of coerced into it because according to the tradition of the law of the law of the Medes and the Persians, once an edict by the king is given, it cannot be withdrawn. Jot down Esther chapter 8 verse 8. You'll you'll see it right there in the empire of Persia. And God had been so faithful to Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar, but you see now it's different. The Persians are in control. I mean, is there some sort of limitation on the the faithfulness of God? Does the faithfulness of God stop? Now that the Persians have the upper hand and the Babylonians have been overthrown and we've seen the transition from the gold to the silver, Daniel chapter 5, the handwriting on the wall chapter, Can can God be trusted to continue to deliver Daniel from problems? Well, let's find out. Daniel 6 is the question and answer. So there is Daniel thrown into the lion's den. And they had starved these lions. We know that, that when, because when the king finally threw Daniel's adversaries into the lion's den, The Bible says they didn't even touch the the ground before these wild animals broke their bones and consumed them. And all these pictures you see of Daniel, you know, where he looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Daniel in the lion's den, muscles bulging, ready to take on the lions. You've seen all those type of pictures and posters. None of them are biblically correct. Because when you document Daniel's age, which the book of Daniel does, he's an old man. He is frail. He is in his 80s, perhaps early 90s when this happens. God had been faithful to him as a young man. Is God going to be faithful to him as an old man? God had been faithful to me under the empire of Babylon, but is he going to be faithful to me under the empire of Persia? And what Daniel discovers is what Joseph discovers. The character of God doesn't change. Doesn't matter if the Babylonians are in control or the, or the Persians are in control. Doesn't matter if you're young or if you're old. In fact, David in the Psalms, in Psalm 37, verse 25, says, I was young, now I'm old. And I've seen it all. But here's something I haven't seen. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed children begging for bread. I've seen it all, but I haven't seen that. Because God is 100% faithful 100% of the time, regardless of human circumstances. And so the king uh, of Persia is tricked into throwing Daniel into the lion's den. He has a sleepless night because he realizes he's been duped. And in the morning, he kind of (laughs) gets near the lion's den and yells in there, Hey, Daniel, are, are you there? Are you okay? Daniel 6, verse 22, Daniel answers. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me. Amen to that. I guess Daniel got an answer to his question. Can I trust you, Lord, at the end of my life under the empire of Persia, just like I was able to trust you towards the beginning of my life under the empire of Babylon. You know, everybody is very, very uptight over this next presidential election. 
I understand why they're uptight. I mean, if all I did is sit in front of cable television all day and listen to talk radio, I'd be uptight too. But because I, I read my Bible first, and I'm not making any sort of prediction about the upcoming election, I don't know who's gonna win, who's gonna lose. It's not who votes that counts, it's who counts the votes as they say anyway, right? I don't know if the economy is going to improve or if it's not. I don't know what's going to happen with our country. I don't know any of those things. I have the same lingering uh, question marks in my mind that you have. But I do know one thing. That no matter what happens, God is going to be faithful to you and he's going to be faithful to me into the new administration. Circumstances go favorably from a human perspective. God is going to be faithful to you. Maybe circumstances don't go so well. Does that somehow tie the hands of God? Oh no. What am I going to do? God's faithfulness continues. That's what Daniel experienced. That's what Joseph experienced. And guess what, folks? That's what you can experience as well as we walk by faith. So chapter 39, the blessing upon Joseph, the temptation and accusation against Joseph, Joseph's incarceration and imprisonment, and yet the faithfulness of God continues. And let me give you one other fast thing about what God is faithful to. It's his promise of salvation. He's faithful to that too. And his promise to us is we as lost sinners can be made right with him by trusting in a provision that he did for us 2,000 years ago. And that relates to the death, burial, resurrection, and ultimately ascension of his son. That transaction paid for every sin debt of the entire human race, past, present, and future. And he simply asks us, he commands us to trust in what Jesus did for us 2,000 years ago, not ourselves. If you're trusting in your own good works for your salvation, you can't get to God because God has arranged salvation so that we trust in the good work Jesus gave us. 2,000 years ago. Trust in that. Trust is more than simply an intellectual assent that these things happened. It's not just a history lesson. It is a history lesson, but it's more than a history lesson. You learn the history of what Jesus did, and then you believe, which means to trust what he accomplished for you. I'm not just memorizing some facts about Jesus in my mind, I'm actually trusting in the truth of those facts for my eternity. That's what it means to believe. That's the only condition that God requires for a lost human being to be saved. We invite anybody within the sound of my voice to respond to that message and the convicting ministry of the Spirit by trusting exclusively in the work of Jesus Christ. You do not have to join a church to do this, nor do you have to raise a hand, walk an aisle, give money, try harder. The world of religion will tell you to do all those other things, but God doesn't. God says it's finished. In fact, the final words of Christ on the cross were it is finished. It's complete. Trust in what he's done for you. You can do that now, even as I am speaking. If it's something that you need more information on, I'm available after the service to talk. But next week we move into Genesis chapter 40. So I'd encourage you to read that chapter uh, this week in preparation for our teaching next Sunday morning. Shall we pray? Father, we're grateful for this account of Joseph and what you did in his life. Help us to not just Look at this as some sort of historical happenstance, but help us to walk these things out 
in our relationship with you this week. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said.